Uh, good morning. So, Richard, let's get started. Um, so you have, you have this amazing storied history, both as a performer and a producer. Um, and I'm curious about the effects of technology on, on, on the business from, from, your, from, from that point of view as a producer and a performer. What are the changes, the recent changes in technology that get you really excited? And are there any that you think are actually making things worse? You know, I never really think that technology makes things worse in the sense that it just is what it is. You know, we have to move with the times, and it would be depressing if we were still making records the way Edison did back in 80, 1877. So, um, you know, I, I don't look at it sort of as better or worse. It's just what it is, and how do we harness it for um, the best for musicians and artists and labels and so on. But I, I you know, I'm sort of completely besotted with technology. I. I used computers uh, in the early 70s. Uh, I've had computers continuously since the early 70s. I made one of the first records ever made, I think maybe the first record ever made with a computer. I recorded the first digital sample using the Fairlight CMI on Kate Bush's album. So I, I, I love being first. I'm an early adopter. I have, I have tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars of really expensive doorstops at home that used to be considered to be cutting edge technology. A little, a little museum of obsolete technology. A rock and Roll Hall of Fame has actually said they want some of my stuff. So <laughs> you know, yeah, so that's it really. But I mean, I think, I think you know, what computers have done is amazing. I think there's a whole new, um, you know, now producers are being asked to produce uh, stems at the end of every project. and. Um, and, 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 and it seems like we're going down to a more granular level of making music available, um, which I don't necessarily think would be a bad thing. I know a lot of producers are opposed to that because they feel like, well, the finished product's the finished product. But I remember that conversation back in the late 70s when remixes first started. You know, I had artists, um, Adam Ann said to me, yeah, that's just the record, you know, the seven inch, you make that one track and it's perfect. And, and I agree with that. I mean, you listen to a record from, like Hit the Road Jack by Ray Charles from the 50s, and the only version you ever hear is that one version, and it's really cool, and you know every beat and every little inflection in that record. But at the same time, the, you know, we've discovered along the way that there's a massive market for re remakes and rethoughts and rethinking and reimaginings and so on and so forth. So it seems to me that if we, we find new markets for stems and other kind of granular breakdowns of productions that would not be a bad thing. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What do you mean by stems and granular production? Well, I mean, you could, you can, you can put out music um, in, a, in, a, in a sort of deconstructed form or in a, in, a, in a do-it-yourself form, if you like. So instead of putting out a finished, you know, two-track, as it were, which is effectively what we're still doing, even though it's digital now, it's still a two-track um, stereo, stereo mix. Um, you know, we've experimented with quadraphonic and we've had all kinds of different things like that over the years, but there's no reason why you couldn't put it out completely broken down. I mean, there's, there, are, there are broken down versions of records out there that you can get and you can deconstruct them and listen to them and so on and so forth. But um, if we could come up with a licensing regimen that would work, um, you know, there's no reason why people couldn't take parts of established records. I mean, this is what started with reggae in like 1951 in Jamaica, you know, and, and sort of continued through hip hop and is now very much a part of what we, of our business, even the mainstream pop business. Um, I want to talk a little bit about artist development. Um, I've, I've heard artist development described as a lost art uh, that no one, no one really knows how to do it anymore. And I, I'm curious how you think artist development has changed over the years. And do you think it's lost? Well, I think every single person in this room would, would argue with the, the idea that artist development is lost. I think, um, you know, people have said that to me for a long time. They say, well, well, one thing they say is, well, the majors don't develop acts. And I go, well, you know, in a way, the majors never did develop acts. And that's true and not true. I mean, the majors have clearly developed acts. But, um, but it, it, you can also go back through history and look at, say, Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley was developed on a independent label on Sun Records. He made four singles for Sun, and then he was picked up by RCA and became the biggest artist of all time uh, at that point in time. So I, I, I think that there's a couple of things. Um, it's, it's, it's easier for, I don't know if it's easier, but the independents depend for their lives on being able to develop artists and being able to hang on to those artists. So um, it's one of the reasons why I'm so committed to the independent sector is because um, 
you know, I think the whole sort of quarterly reporting thing when you work for a large corporation, especially a large corporation owned by a corporation that isn't even a music business corporation, you, you know, you're so dependent on those quarterly results that it's very hard to spend the kinds of time, uh, the kind of time that you need to spend to develop someone. You look at someone like, y you know, you go back to say someone like a Springsteen and it took him three albums to break, you know. Um, it's hard to imagine that happening these days uh, on a major label, but the independents do that all the time, you know, and uh, so, uh, no, I really don't think artist development's dead at all. I think it's alive and well, uh, especially in the independent sector. Has it, has it changed, though? I mean, does the, you, you talk about the, the independents having that responsibility and, and, in fact, having that necessity because that's, that's a place where they can make a difference, but has the, has the technique of artist development or the project of artist development changed over time because of changes in the market and changes in technology? Well, practically speaking, yes. Um, you know, you can look at a lot of different things that have changed. So pre-96, whenever the, you know, Clinton decided to deregulate the FCC and allow the consolidation of radio, you could go to your, lo I lived in Maryland at the time. I had like four local radio stations that played alternative rock and rock. I was, you know, WHFS and 98 Rock and DC 101 and a couple of others. I could go to those stations and I knew the program directors, I knew the music directors, and I could, you know, if I, if I had a good record, if I had a lo good local artist that was hot, they would play it at four in the morning, they would put them on their, on their radio show, and, you know, you had an opportunity to build up through that, and then once the roll-up happened and Clear Channel and iHeart and so on and so forth, you, you just can't get to those people anymore, you know, they're central. I'm not even sure there are people now. I think well, if you call <laughs> up iHeartRadio, you get a machine. Right, yeah, yeah, no, I think it's a closet in San Antonio or something like that is what I heard. Um, so, um, you know, that's just one small aspect. So, I mean, not that you're dependent on radio to, to, to get a record by any means, but that was certainly one tool, one arrow in the quiver, as it were. I think touring... Um, you know, has changed significantly in my lifetime. And when I was a kid, you could always get a gig in a bar somewhere playing, and then you could spin up, you know, you could basically climb up the ladder from, from there. And that's more difficult now, because you walk into a bar and they're playing a Spotify playlist or Sirius XM, or um, they got a DJ. If you're lucky, they have a DJ. They're paying a human, at least, you know? <laughs> so um, all these things are obstacles. And I think these are things we try to work on, because um, what happens is, and this, this happened way back in 1920 when radio um, came along, is, you know, you, you start to see uh, human beings being pushed out of jobs, and it's not, I'm definitely not a Luddite, <laughs> I think you can tell that. Um, you know, I, I'm pro-progress, but at the same time, I don't like to see, um, I don't, what I really don't like to see is people's work being used and those people not being compensated. That, that, that really offends me. And, and that's effectively what we're seeing. We're seeing this in bars. Because by the way, when Sirius XM's playing in a bar or Spotify's playing in a bar, those, well, actually, they g I guess they're getting the streaming royalties from Sirius XM. But if they're playing radio in the bar, if they're playing records in the bar, um, you know, if the DJ's there, the musicians aren't getting paid. The writer's getting paid, the DJ's probably getting paid, but the musicians aren't. And uh, so that's, you know, probably four people that, uh, would be sitting in the corner playing music that aren't, aren't able to get their careers started. Um, you mentioned radio, and then let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, I, I'm sort of struck by the fact, as, as you point out, that in some ways it's much harder to, to break into radio from a, from a less established label or a less established artist. Um, you know, at the same time, radio is still a massive, massive presence. Um, and, and, and is a way that, that so many millions of people are exposed to music. And so how, how has that uh, role changed? And is there anything that, that the smaller labels or, or, or lesser known artists can do about that? I don't think there's much the smaller labels and lesser known artists can do about it. I think there's a couple of things. One is we really need radio to start paying us. I mean, it's just not right that they don't pay. Two is you're absolutely correct that radio is the biggest revenue generator of all these services. I mean, it generates more than double. I think it's it's about double or more than double what the streaming services generate. Uh, Barry Masowski just gave an amazing presentation yesterday where he analyzed this, and he came up with an interesting conclusion, and that is, is that radio does not promote music. Music promotes radio. And so the statistic I always like that actually I got from Barry 
was um, that, in fact, he just modified it down slightly. I used to say $11.5 billion is generated from the use of music on radio. He said it's actually $10.7 billion. But that's still almost double what the music industry, industry makes for making these records, and they're making almost twice as much for playing those records. So clearly we've got a problem here. And as you say, they, they are massive. It is the biggest, I, he had a, an amazing graph. The other thing that he showed in his presentation that was fascinating was that the idea that radio breaks music is, is kind of an illusion. Um, in fact, something more than 50% of virtually any format is playing catalog. So they're not playing current releases. And as you know, I mean, you struggle to hear, I don't know how many tracks it is they add a year, but it's a very tiny amount. And then you can, then you roll that but into... They, but they play them a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, th that's the other thing. I always say, why would anybody buy this record? I, I, every time I turn the radio on, I hear it. And that was when I did listen to the radio. Um, so, you know, I, I, we really have to solve the radio problem. Yeah. Well, um, and part of that has to do with a, an issue that I know is, is close to your heart and um, it is in no way arcane, um, terrestrial right. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, as everybody probably knows, um, we're in the company of Iran, China, and North Korea. In fact, somebody said the other day we should have taken a picture when, when Donald Trump was with Kim Jong-un and said, you know, the, the two of the countries who don't pay royalties to um, musicians and labels uh, get together, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it's pretty, pretty sad. It's a pretty sad company to be in, I think. And, um, you know, we just have to fix that. And I spoke to Gordon Smith the other day at the NAB, and he said he's, he's definitely committed to fixing it. So, you know, I hope he's being truthful about that. And we're certainly in negotiations with the NAB about it. Um, at the same time, you know, they have the upper hand here. Uh, we don't have a lot of leverage, and um, we really need to get it right. I mean, we, we would unlock um, hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, overseas royalties that would come back into this country. It would boost our economy, but it would also mean a lot to every label and every artist and every musician and singer. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just super important that we get it done. It, it's just a question of leverage. Right now, it's kind of on ice because of the MMA. And uh, we want to get the MMA done. And it was really difficult to set that aside. But we all, because we wanted to be together for the first time ever, the entire industry has been together, we made the decision to set that aside for a minute. What, what does the fix look like? What, what, what is the remedy? Is it just the NAB waves a wand and suddenly the situation has changed? Or is it more complicated than that? Well, I mean, of course, the NAB, like A2IM, is not really, you know, the NAB represents radio. So, you know, like as just as A2IM represents labels, you know, we don't really do anything for ourselves. We do it for the labels in conjunction with the labels, with the labels blessing, and same with NAB. Um, I mean, yeah, that would be amazing if they just waved the magic wand and did it. I, that's not likely to happen. It's going to be some, you know, complicated... Uh, uh, well, maybe not complicated form. It might be a, a much more simplified form, or in fact, and that's what we're talking about. Um, but you know, it has to. You know, I think I think in the end, for it to really work, it's got to be uh, an equitable situation for them and us. I mean, we're interested in in making it work for them. We're not interested in crushing radio or any other service for that matter. We recognize we um, live in a shared ecosystem, and we need to we need to make it work for all parties. Um, we wish they saw it the same way with us. Does it require legislative change? The reason it requires legislative change is so that we can get the overseas royalties. We will not be able to get the overseas royalties without. We, some of our labels have struck direct deals with radio, and they work very well for those labels. If you've got a, we have several independent labels that have massive artists, and they um, can strike a direct deal with radio, and they're very happy. Um, they're getting paid for the spins and everything. So you could have a negotiated deal. Um, but if we don't get it legislated, we won't be able to get the money from the UK, from Germany, from the Philippines, wherever. Um, but the way con our Congress works is if you don't come to them with a consensus bill, basically with all parties saying, yep, we're agreed, here's the terms, it's pretty difficult to get a bill. It's just going to be a power. I, I mean, even even with that, it's not so easy. Uh, Congress being what it is these days. Well, you're seeing that with the Senate. I mean, we got a 415 to zero 
a unanimous vote in the House, which was amazing. I mean, that just almost never happens in any area, let alone music. Um, but then we get to the Senate, and the Senate's a completely different animal because, you know, it doesn't take very much to stop a bill, and uh, you only need one opposing party in a, in a district somewhere, and that, that, that senator it feels duty-bound to stand in the way, as it were. So w you w optimistic time frame for on this to happen? On the MMA? Yeah, uh, well, or, or on, the, on the terrestrial right issue, yeah. Well, I would say, I think, you know, the thinking is that the MMA is going to get done this year. Um, I don't know exactly how that timing works. We're sort of pretty much on schedule so far, which is amazing, because we all wondered whether that would happen. Um, so I think this year for the MMA, and I would say immediately afterwards, we've got to get back to the terrestrial right. And we're still working on the terrestrial right. We, we meet about it weekly, and we, we're still having conversations with the NAB, but to really, you know, put the full pressure on, I would say later this year, hopefully. We, we originally were hoping to roll it in with the MMA if we could come to a consensus agreement, um, but it just didn't seem like we could. We're still working on that. that I so I, I, w I would hope sometime in the next 12 months. That's optimistic. Yeah. Um, another uh, business question. I mean, how, how do you see the streaming economy as having changed over the last year? I mean, since, since last Indie Week, what, what are the... The, the major changes that you looked at, and, and what do you think, um, where, do you, where do you see it going from the perspective of artists and labels? Well, you're seeing the playing field level a little bit. I mean, Apple's obviously coming up hugely in terms of subscribers, and that's great. You know, we've seen the rolling together of, uh, you know, the various different Google services, and we'll see how that plays out. We're also seeing, by the way, the European uh, Parliament just uh, saying unequivocally that services have to be licensed, which could, s you know, sometime in the next two years, three years, um, change the landscape with respect to YouTube and, and the safe harbor and the notice and takedown process. Um, I think the biggest change seems to have been the Spotify uh, listing, which has now uh, stimulated them, it seems, to go into this direct signing um, conversation which really changes the equation, actually. Potentially changes the equation. How so? Well, I mean, the problem is that they have data that we don't have. And really, we think that's our data and we should have equal access to it. So in a way, it's kind of an anti-competitive advantage that they have because they can see data before our labels can see it. And so they have the opportunity to jump and make an investment that's not a guess, it's not an estimate, it's not based on gut the way everybody here has to work. Um, it's based on hard knowledge, hard facts. And so I think that distorts the playing field in, in a very unhealthy way. Um, so we're, you know, obviously we're having conversations about that. It's a, it's a challenge. I mean, that, that dynamic I think is very familiar to anybody who's worked closely with Apple or Amazon who have a very similar relationship to the data and the customer um, and are, are kind of reluctant to give that up. Um, I think it's our data, really. I think it should be shared data, at least. At the very least, it should be shared. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about labels and, uh, and their role. I mean, at, at one time, I know record labels really saw a, 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 an important role uh, as being kind of a curator of, of taste, a curator of genre. Um, and, I, and I'm curious, again, with the, with, the, with the fragmentation of labels and the development of technology, if, if you think the curation role is more important today than it used to be or less important? Well, I, I unequivocally think it's more important. I mean, uh, you know, the independents have always been curated. Uh, first off, they've always been sort of branded labels. I mean, you go back and you think about the, you know, uh, Island Records and Atlantic Records. Back in the sort of 50s, they had the, the R&B thing, and 60s, they had the soul thing, and now, you know, goodness knows what Atlantic is at this point. But, um, and, you, and it's interesting, you see that whenever an independent se sells to a major, they just completely lose their identity. So to the independents, uh, identity is really important. I mean, uh, I think that, uh, uh, first off, I mean, nobody ever walks into a store and says, I want the latest Sony record, but people will walk into a store and ask for, you know, I saw Tom sitting here a minute ago, Tommy, latest Tommy Boy record, or Hopeless Records is 
you know, strongly branded. And, and, you know, I could go through all of our labels, Warp, Ninja Tune, you know, they all have strong identities. Yeah, exactly. So um, uh, I, I think that uh, the branded identity is important, but we've sort of been stripped of the benefit of that with digital because our labels are not um, uh, listed on digital. You can't find out. You know, I remember as a kid buying, I can still see that Atlantic uh, label. I can still see the Motown label. I can still see the Island label in my head. And, you know, you could see it from 20 feet away. It was identifiable. Now I have to go jump from my Spotify playlist over to Wikipedia to find out what label it's on and figure out whether it's independent or major or not. And that, that bothers me, and that's something we work on as well. So, but I think in terms of the, um, uh, you know, your original question, which is how important is curation, I think that is really the, the um, you know, the distinguishing factor with independence. I think that's the... Uh, the unique selling proposition, as it were. But is it more challenging today? I don't think it's more challenging to um, to curate. No, I think that uh, I think it's easy to sort of go with an algorithmic sort of whatever. If it's selling, I'll sign it. You know, and that's a conversation I have with YouTube because I, well, we're doing a lot. You know, we 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 have YouTube uh, superstars, and you go, well, you know, but. Like, look, look at Psy. I mean, it's far enough back, Gangnam Style. It's a great record, huge hit. A lot of people liked it. Um, but is there a career there, you know? I mean, are we going to get a U2 out of that? Are we going to get a Prince out of that? Are we going to get a Miles Davis or a Sly Stone? And that's my number one concern, um, having come up through the route that I did and having the passion for music that I do. My number one concern is that we're not going to have another Miles Davis or another Sly Stone or another you know, you name it, Nat King Cole, you know, go back as far as you want. Um, and those artists were all a product of artist development. You know, they weren't all overnight successes. And um, it took a label that believed in them and a lot of hard work over a long period of time a and some ups and downs in their careers, too. You look at that, that's another thing. It's, it's, you know, it's not just a question of, you know, you have a hit and then it's plain sailing from there. I mean, every big artist has had periods of time when they, you yeah. know, they can't get arrested. And, uh, yeah, and, and, the, and the labels would keep them. I mean, these days, if you, if you, you, know, you put out one album that bombs and you'll just get dropped. Yeah. So, I, I, uh, you know, I'm thinking out loud. <laughs> I, I really think that curation is the number one thing. I think that's the unique selling proposition for independence. I think that's where the independents win every day, and I think it's where they'll continue to win. Um, I have a couple more questions, but when I'm done, I'd love to get some questions from the audience. So if you're formulating them, um, be patient, and I'll uh, we'll call on you in a bit. Um, you talked about you know Springsteen breaking, taking three albums to break, um, and and I'm curious about how artists break through today, and if you can divulge you know the secrets of of breaking a band online, and talk a little bit about how that differs today from what it was in say Springsteen's day or your day. You know, and I'm not the expert on this because, I, you know, once I, once you get out of a label um, and you come into this job, you suddenly don't have your hands on it anymore. And, and you know, I've been in this job now two and a half years, and, um, you know, it's, that's quite a long time. A lot has happened in two and a half years in terms of it. But what I would say this as an overarching uh, principle is that it, the overarching sort of first principle of how you break an artist is exactly the same today as it was in 1960 and 1950 and 1930, and that is you simply have to get as many impressions as you can, and you've got to get as much engagement as you can. Because, I mean, you know, it's kind of like you go back to the dot-com boom, and you think about those ads that they, those dot-com companies ran on, um, on the Super Bowl, and they got millions and millions of impressions, but they got zero engagement, so they were out of business two weeks later because they spent all their VC money. Um, I, that's exactly the same problem uh, that labels have and that artists have insofar as, um, you know, you can get the, you know, the, the, the received wisdom used to be in the business world. You've got to go out. You have to open for a big act. You'll get tons of impressions. Well, maybe you will, maybe you won't. You, you know, you, 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 you sit there, you know, your band's playing to 25 people in a 10,000-person shed or something opening for a, a big band. So um, it can work. Um, Getting impressions is definitely important, but you definitely have to get that engagement. And so it doesn't really matter how you do that, as long as you do it legally and ethically, I guess. Um, but you, you, you really have to find a way to do that. And people are finding all kinds of innovative ways to do that. 
touring is still a big factor for some bands. And certainly, I mean, rock kind of doesn't exist in streaming right yet, right now, but rock bands are still making good money on the road, and I think that we'll see a resurgent of rock and alternative rock and active rock and so on down the line. But, you know, people are using, but they were using SoundCloud to sort of start getting impressions and then translate that over to Spotify. The difficulty now is just the amount of stuff that's being uploaded. I mean, Stefan Bloom, before he left Spotify, told me 500,000 uploads a month, and then about a week ago, I read that there are a million uploads every six weeks. So, you know, I don't know if it's increased or if that those are approximate numbers, but either way, you know, I, I believe that in 1968, there were 6,000 albums released. So that's 60,000 tracks in a year compared with 500 to 600,000 tracks uh, a month now. Um, it makes for an uphill struggle. But I think that um, it's done through all the normal means, and indies are really inventive like that. In terms of engagement, so I, I, you, 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 you distinguish between impressions and engagement. Um, are there specific digital tools that you think are really, really good at engagement? I mean, something beyond just touring, which, as you say, is a, a constant. But is there any, is there any uh, kind of uh, like magic engagement tool online? Well, I mean, uh, social media is obviously the engagement tool, but it's really when you think about it, it's more of a sort of test of engagement than it is actually an, uh, you know, a sort of a magic wand to get engagement. But I think the thing that's interesting today is the speed of feedback, you know, because you can get feedback very, very quickly. You can see, you put stuff up, and you can immediately see whether it's, uh, whether it's connecting with people or not. And I think that's, uh, that's valuable. And that goes back to the point I make about Spotify having sort of... Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a competitive advantage by having access to data more quickly than we do, and sometimes just better data than we have. I think that we really need to have access. We need to have a level playing field with data. But um, it, it's definitely tough. I mean, I'm talking to labels all the time, and everybody's struggling with this. Um, but the same rules apply. I mean, people s love music uh, as much as they ever did. I think maybe more than they ever did. There's certainly more music used today than ever before. It's really just how do you rise above the noise, and um, I think it's the standard. It's persistence. You know, I, there's that book out, grit, right? And I think grit's really what I, I used to call it persistence in my books, but I think grit's a better word. Um, you mentioned uh, social media. I'm curious how social media has affected A and R. Really, has it has it changed the way that 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 that, uh, that A and R people look at at who to bring up? Well, there's no question about that. I mean, that's that's probably a number one technique. You know, certainly if somebody, even back in the late 90s when I was still managing bands, um, you know, people wanted to see, well, actually our business has always wanted to see numbers. They always wanted to see numbers. I mean, you know, that's why RCA s signed Elvis Presley, because they could see the numbers. And um, every deal I ever got, including my own deals, were based on the fact that I'd sold a bunch of, um, vinyl EPs back in the 70s and LPs later and CDs later and downloads later. You know, I mean, and, and I remember, you know, shopping deals and it would be, well, how many, you know, how many units have you done? You know, how much airplay do you have? And, and so on and so forth. So I think, I think social media is just sort of an extension of that. But again, it's a much faster extension of that. And I think, um, uh, you know, artists that don't really have much social media activity are going to struggle. How much interactivity uh, is there with uh, with the labels at A2IM, and, and how is A2IM growing? Is that fair? Well, it's all about interactivity with the labels. You know, we just expanded the board um, for this reason, to give more people experience. So we have 11 voting board members, but we used to have three advisory board members, and last night uh, the board voted to expand that. So now we have, this year we have six um, advisory board members, so a total of 17 board members. The advisory board members can't vote, but most of the time our, board, our boards are just conversations. Um, uh, and so, you know, that's where we air all these kinds of uh, concerns and um, differences, if there are any. So the board obviously represents the membership, but I try to meet members as much as I can. I mean, uh, you know, I talk to you, Jenna, and, um, you know, I talk to most of our labels at some point. Patrick, I think he's just right behind you, you know, talks to the labels constantly. So there's a real interaction there. And he and I are always talking about concerns and he feeds things to me. 
um, as uh, you know, as we find out about them. And I just get calls. I mean, you know, I'm hearing that physical piracy is still a problem. Apparently, I'm hearing about more Chinese. You know, this is something I just heard about a couple of weeks ago, and so you know, I have to dig into that. And that th you most of our, uh, all of our information really comes from the labels ultimately, either through a board member or just from a member reaching out to me. Um, how it's growing? Well, Patrick's just, you know, he brings in a label a day. At least it seems like we're nearly up to 600. Probably by beginning of next week, we'll be at 600 labels. When I started, we were at 373, um, and. Uh, you know, we've got nine staff. We used to have four staff. Um, our budget's uh, about double what it was. Um, Indie Week's many times bigger than it was three years ago. I think it's organically growing. There's just there's a need. You know, I, I'm not taking credit for growing it. I'm just saying the demand is there. You know, we're, we're, we're people are coming to us and wanting to join. So I find that incredibly encouraging. You have another question back there? Yeah. How well, big can uh, the indie share market become? Yeah, that's a great question, Tom. In the 50s, the late 50s and early 60s, the independent market share was 75%. And I did the research. For my last book is called The History of Music Production. I did the research each decade. And I was shocked. I, did not, I was not aware of that. But when you think about it, that was the heyday of Sun. I've forgotten what Buddy Holly's label was called, but it was, he, it was an independent. Oh, uh, all right, yeah, yeah. But you got Chess, you have Motown, you had Atlantic, Stax, Vault. Um, you know, you could go on and on. Um, there were just so many independent labels. So I, I think that, I mean, at what point do there not be, are there no majors anymore? <laughs> you know, if the major market share gets so small, are there not majors anymore? I, I, I think that it, we can, we can, it can go all the way. I think what we can what get is back it today? It's about, it's about 37% today. So... Sorry? Worldwide. Well, I'm thir about 37% in the U.S. as well. And, um, and we, we, um, we were at 29% in 2005. I have the paperwork from the inauguration, inaug inaugural meeting of HYM, and it's listed there as 29%. So I found that interesting that we've jumped up, um, you know, that much in, in, in this period of time. But I think it's going to increase a lot more, Tom. And I think um, my goal is certainly to get it above 50%. Um, but I care less about the market share than I care about a healthy, competitive market for Indies, really. I mean, I think that's the most important thing is that everybody, um, you know, can make a living and survive. That's the number one thing for me is can artists and labels make a good middle-class living? I mean, there's always going to be some labels that are going to be high flyers and they're going to make hundreds of millions of dollars and ha have massive hits that go to number one and, uh, and so on. And, and, and I'm happy for those labels. But where I really worry is in the middle that those labels get pushed out the bottom and are unable to make a living anymore because it's from the middle that the old everybody starts out at the bottom and has to go through the middle to get to the top. Um, so we need to make sure there's a healthy middle class in order to have uh, you know the real successes that we need down the line. Did that answer your question, Tom? Yeah, I mean, that's a question about attribution if you didn't hear it. And something we touched on earlier, um, I think this is a critical problem. Um, you know, I've been discussing this with, I actually had a conversation with Robert Kondrick in, in, the, in the early 2000s when I was on the producer engineer wing steering committee and we were trying to get credits for everybody actually. And producer engineer, we're, Maureen Droney who runs the producer engineer wing is incredibly egalitarian. So we went out to get credits for producers, but actually we said, let's just get credits for everybody. Let's get it for the musicians, the labels, everybody. and. Um, and Robert Kondrick's response was, nobody cares. And we've gotten that response from various different digital services over the years again and again and again, and recently. Having said that, we've got Jaxta coming up, which is all about line of notes and credits, and I think that's an amazing thing, and I really hope Jaxta really sort of got launched through A2IM. Apparently, you know, they did really, really well this week um, over at the Spread House there, and so we really support their mission. Um, you know, we're also seeing Discogs expanding its um, business, and Discogs has always been a good, a good organization. But you're right, we need it. You, I, and I've said this, I, I had this conversation with um, Amazon the other week and with Spotify that we just want some, at least if it's a mouse over or something like that, or, you know, a 
the little three buttons you can, the little three dots you can press on them to see who the label is. Drives me crazy. I'm in the gym, I hear a record, I want to know f who it is, and I want to know what label it's on, and I, can't, I have to wait till I go home and look it up on, on Wikipedia. Not to defend the streaming services, but radio never did much with labels either. I mean, well, I, when I was growing up, if you needed to know a song on the radio, what label it was on, you had to go to a record store. But that's the difference between your, your, your generation and mine, um, because when I was a kid, they never failed to back announce a record, and they would always say, uh, the, and the label, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So, you know, it would say that was Nack and Cole on Capitol Records. You know. That's probably because they were being paid by the labels. Yeah, maybe, but they still are. <laughs> <laughs> a little more indirectly. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> we have another question? Yes, in the back. Gosh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, I'm probably the only person in this room who thinks this, but I still have um, some uh, faith in the idea that blockchain will, will, will be helpful to us. I think smart contracts would really change everything because it would, if it, the transaction would eliminate transactional costs for you guys practically. I mean, once you set up a smart contract, it automatically pays out. I get that you know, the energy usage of um, blockchain is outrageous and, and that could wind up being extremely costly. But, you know, Bill Gates said in The Road Ahead uh, that he wrote, I think it was in the late 80s, he said that the thing about technology is that people always um, over-predict in the short term and under-predict in the long term. And that's been my experience. You know, people always tell you, oh, it's the latest hot thing and everyone's excited about it and then, oh no, it's not really happening and then suddenly, you know, you become aware of the fact that it's actually sort of crept up on you and it's there. So I wonder if smart contracts might not be something that could really change things because that's w when you're small, when you're one person or two people or four people, the, you know, the, 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 um, it's labor intensive dealing with everything you have to deal with, with neighboring rights and royalties and royalty payments and so on and so forth. Um, beyond that, I don't have, there's no sort of whiz kid technologies I can think of that will really change things. I think getting access to our data and having um, the ability to crunch the data in a meaningful way. Um, I mean, there's people, Tom's worked on some stuff, um, this engagement chart that you were working on when I first started here, Tom, and I, I think that's fascinating. I think if we could kind of codify that and make it a better system so people could sort of easily read whether a record has legs or whether it doesn't have legs. It's, you know, what does it have engagement, what doesn't it have engagement? And it's complex. It's not just a question of looking at your Spotify sales or your Apple sales it's a, or your streams. It's, it's, um, it, you know, it's a question of tying in all your social media activity and your live and everything else. And I think if we could crack that nut, um, that could actually make things a lot better for the indies. What about, I, I mean, I saw this on the schedule for this week, what about uh, virtual reality and augmented reality? Is that something that you think is underutilized? Well, I, you know, it's, I'm a total fan. I mean, I have an HTC Vive at home, and I'm, uh, I, I use that thing all the time. I absolutely love it, VR. Um, I haven't played with AR as much, although I think AR is really amazing as well. I think I may even have more potential in VR, but VR is just such a... Uh, transformative experience, and uh, it's it absolutely um, really fires me up. And and I wasn't a gamer or anything before, you know. I mean, I played games with my kids when they were younger just to see how it worked, but I never kind of got addicted to games. VR is kind of addictive, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, I don't see anybody really experimenting with that very much in the music space, and I think that it really is, I think there is a huge potential there. I think it might be an area where independents could uh, get involved. It changes the nature of music, though, because music becomes non-contiguous, very much the way it is in a gaming environment. And I think that that, and that goes to what I was saying before about stems and more granular uses of music. You know, we might have to start thinking about music in a very different way. And my observation is from looking at the, I used to have a dozen interns when I was at Smithsonian, and we have several interns. Well, my entire office are millennials now, but you know everybody's just listening to music all day long. People are using music in a very different way today than they did in the 90s and the 80s and the 70s. It's been changing continuously. Absolutely. I mean, I, I consider like one of the big changes in the workplace 
from when I started many years ago and now is is headphones in the office. I mean, right. that was just not done no. um, in the in the 1980s and, and even in through the early 90s. It was just not it, it would have been considered rude or insubordinate or something. And now it's just routine. It made Slack a billion dollar company. Yeah, because you can't talk to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, one, we have one more question. Uh, all right, Richard, I'll ask you the catch-all last question. Um, what is the best piece of advice you have for someone just getting started in the industry today, either as a label or as an artist? Join A to I am, because that's, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, I mean, that's, that's where the information is. I mean, look, I joined A to I am I don't, I, quite close to the beginning um, when I was at Smithsonian Folkways. We were, we were still going through the digital transformation, I think, uh, you know, Apple had started up not long before that. Apple iTunes had started up, and I realized, okay, this is, you know, it's not Kansas anymore. You know, we gotta, I gotta figure this out, and I figured everything out by coming to A2IM, by reading the newsletters, by talking to other people, networking, rubbing shoulders. I mean, I think that, you know, this first off, our business is a relationship business. Maybe every business is a relationship business, but I, I think the music industry's very much a relationship business. You can't get anything. I mean, uh, I think I was saying to Case the other night that I still talk to people that I knew. I, I sat at the NNPA dinner the other night with a guy that I actually uh, knew when I was 16 years old in Christchurch, New Zealand. You know, so relationships go for a very, very long time in this industry. And, and you know, uh, my advice to artists has always been: don't burn bridges because you're going to run. A, we're going to run across those people again. But um, so, but I think that you know. This is an amazing place, not because of what I do. Or I'm, my team is amazing, for sure. But it's an amazing place just because you can rub shoulders with people who really, really know what they're doing and really know what they're talking about and, and that transference of knowledge. You can always find someone here who knows the answer to your problem or at least is going through the same problem and will help you work through it and you can work through it jointly. I think that's a very good uh, note to end on. I'm sure Richard would be happy to take your question yeah, that's we a, absolutely that's agree with that. It's it's a, it's a challenge for a lot of organizations that have a single kind of tent pole every year. How do you keep that energy? How do you keep that engagement? Uh, we 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 face it at Inc. Um, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Richard Burgess. Thank you, and thanks to Jim as well. I really appreciate it, Jim. <laughs>